great? I wanted to, I asked Pastor Michelle to come back up to the keys. Uh, I wanted us just before we jump in the word this morning to step into a moment that I believe has been ordered by the by Holy Spirit as I was sitting there, I think just right after communion. I felt like the Lord said that this was a day of decision. And what that meant was this. I'm not playing off that old that, 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 that phrase that has gone around for a long time. But today specifically, I feel like there are those, including myself, that are here, that you're at the precipice of, of, of a decision that you need to make. And the reason I wanted to just take a moment and step into this is because I feel like the Lord said that if you will make the decision, just today, all God is asking of you is for you to step into the decision. And that if you will make the decision, and you'll set your heart, and you'll set your mind, you'll set your emotions to that decision. What I feel like I heard the Lord say was that He will empower you in the days to come and give you full revelation of how to walk out that decision. That it's not just you stepping into the grind, but it's you stepping into a partnership. A partnership with Holy Spirit whereby He anoints you, whereby He empowers you to live out the reality of the decision that you're making today. So I want you just to bow your head. And I want you to just ask the Lord. Some of you, as soon as I said that, some of you said, I know exactly the decision that I need to make. And I believe today that by you making that before the Lord in this moment that I believe is ordained of God, you making that decision today is going to concrete something. The decision that you need to make has just been kind of floating out there and hammered back and forth. And yet today you're going to anchor that decision in your soul. I believe that the decision has already been anchored in eternity. But now you're grabbing a hold of it and you're going to anchor it to your soul. You're going to anchor it to your emotions. And it's going to be more than just you going, I can do this. No, it's going to be, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But the decision is yours. If you don't know what that decision is, that's your first prayer. Just to stop for a moment. That's why I wanted to create this kind of a, a moment this morning as we Sabbath together. To say, Lord, what is it before me? What is, what is it that I'm walking through that you want me to anchor this morning? By the authority of the word and by the authority of the believer that I am, I'm anchoring that moment. Go ahead and just ask the Lord that. I'll give a moment just for everybody to come to the place of going, I know what my decision is. It could be a relationship. It could be a financial decision. It could be your own life before the Lord. It could be a commitment. It could be a release. But it's a decision. Now with your hands just held in front of you, would you just very quietly right where you are, I believe this is a tender shepherding moment where Holy Spirit is coming alongside of you and strengthening you in this moment. Go ahead, just make your commitment, make your decision before the Lord today. Even you doing that is, is bringing you to a, a place of supernatural breakthrough today. In Jesus' name. Pray that before the Lord. Lord, today I decide that I will, whatever it is, go ahead, just right where you are. And now, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the reality of the purposes, the reality of the intent of God in our lives. And I thank you that as you bring us, Lord, before your presence in, in tender moments like this, as we as the people of, of this community of faith Sabbath together, Lord, that you give opportunity for us to stop and to go, I, I decide to do this. And I thank you today, Lord, that that decision, every decision that's been made in a day of decision is anchored now in the authority of the word. Anchored now, Lord, in the, in the prophetic moment that you have ordained for us. 
and we will not be shaken. And I thank you that over the next few days, Lord, that even as you said today, that Holy Spirit will take opportunity to bring full revelation of what this decision means. And that not only that, but Lord, that you will bring a, a full sense of how, Lord, thank you for the how to accomplish what we have set before you today. And we release it. Come on now, this is important. I hope you're praying all of this. We release it now, God, into your timing. We surround it now with faith, hope, and love. And we give birth to its fruition. And I declare the reality. I declare the manifestation of the reality of the kingdom of God in this decision that I have set before you. Come, kingdom of God. Say it. Be done, will of God. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You look gorgeous today, by the way. All right, can we just give the Lord a round of applause for what he's doing in this house and what he has done? Turn in your Bibles with me this morning to Psalm 23. And the good news is, and I think it's a, a, a moment of miracles, is that I'm actually going to finish this uh, series today. So how's that? I think we've been in it four or five weeks, so that's not bad, but it's been an amazing series as we have just taken time to prophetically walk through Psalm 23. It's been, it's been a revelation to me in a lot of areas. I want to read it, and then uh, we'll pray over our word, and we'll jump right into it. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters, and now you're reading that, and all of you now have a greater sense of, of, of what the prophet is saying here. He, is, he restores my soul. My soul is restored, amen? He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake or for the sake of his name. And even though I would walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Say those three words with me. Shall follow me. Say it again. Shall follow me. All the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, thank you today that my heart is good ground for the seed of the word of God. My mind is alert. My spirit is receptive. I am attentive, Lord, to the things that Holy Spirit wants to ignite in these moments. That I would not leave here, Father, having missed anything that you desire to say to me. I grasp everything today. My spirit man is wide awake. And I bring my emotions into alignment today, spirit, soul, and body, my mind, my will, my emotions, in Jesus' name, to receive all that you have for me, and I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. amen. And so now we have talked through what this psalm means and what the king is talking about as he walks through some very difficult times and very difficult seasons in our life. And I think probably all of us, if, if, with, without any sense of there being one person that couldn't raise their hand, all of us could raise our hand and say, I've been through some hard times in my life. Say amen to that. We've all been there. And so he describes that, and then all of a sudden, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. He comes to this place uh, of verse 4, and he begins to lay out for us what I call prophetic principles when walking through the valley. In fact, you could title this message that, Prophetic Principles When Walking Through the Valley. What I appreciate about the Lord in giving us those things is that God always sets before us a true north. And a true north is really important. If you've ever gotten lost, uh, you wish you had a GPS. Come on, amen. I, I, I'm the guy that every single time I turn on my GPS and set it in front of me and going on a trip and it gives me play by play, turn by turn, things that I have to decide, I always just go, Lord, I am so thankful for that thing on my dash right now. Because I remember the days of the atlases. Oh, a actually, to be honest with you, I remember the days before the atlases. And that was nothing but a... And it folded like in 20 directions. 
And by the time you got it unfolded, it filled up the whole cab of your car. I think a lot of divorces have occurred because of road trips. Where do I turn? I, there's a little dot here, and I'm pretty sure that's the one. Where are we now? I don't really know. You took the wrong turn. Well, you told me to turn there. That's what I thought the map said. All of a sudden, we need Kimber Brokaw in our lives. She's our counselor, for those of you who don't know that. So he comes to these prophetic principles and gives us the true north. The instruction of righteousness breaks through. The instruction of righteousness. That, that's why it's so important when we live in a crazy, mixed-up world, it's important that you and I embrace instruction in righteousness. Not just somebody's idea, not just somebody's opinion, not just somebody's theology, not just a toe in a denominational line, but that you and I are accurately hearing from and perceiving the word of instruction, the word of righteousness that comes from the word of God. I need a better amen. Because I could have gone all day and just said that and we're good. So here we go. Number one, here's the first prophetic principle when walking through the valley. Number one, I will fear no evil. I will fear no evil. Now, can I, can I be the very first one to admit that that's a lot easier said than done? Is it okay that we're honest this morning? And that's not a negative confession of faith. That's just my observation of my life and your life. It's a lot easier said than done to say, well, I'll tell you what, now this morning, bless God, I will fear no evil. What's wrong with you? What's your problem? You're, going, you're in fear, brother. Hold on a second. It's a prophetic principle that you and I have to embrace, and I have to tell you this morning that it's something that we have to grow into. Come on, amen. amen. We have to grow into those prophetic principles that I will fear no evil. I'm the guy that if I am fast asleep, I'm the guy that you don't want to all of a sudden wake up without any notice. I'm the guy that kind of needs to be nudged. Now, I'm not talking about the nudging that comes from Michelle's alarm clock and, and, and she resets it 30 times every morning. That's not the nudging that I need. The other night I was in bed and I was sound asleep, had gone to bed before her. And, and, and I, don't know, I don't know if I was dreaming, I don't know. And all of a sudden she opened the door and stepped inside of the bedroom and I freaked out. What, what, who, uh, who's in here? She's like, chill, bro. As soon as I realized it was her, I went back to sleep. What is this? I will fear. Say it with me. I will fear no evil. Let me, t let me break this down for you. We'll dive a little bit deeper. The, the psalmist is saying, the king is saying this. I, I refuse to get into dread. That's what he's saying. And I've told you before, there's a difference between an emotional fear and a spirit of fear. The problem with that is that the, as long as it's on the level of emotional fear or this emotional sense of, uh-oh, something's going on here, it's at that point that you can bring it into check because if you don't bring it into check at the level of the emotional fear, it opens the door for the spirit of fear. And that's what the psalmist is saying, is that I refuse to get into dread. In fact, he's saying this. Right now, as I'm walking through this valley, and this is probably good news for all of us, because what he's saying is, is that I'm walking, as I'm walking through this valley, two things are very real in my life right now that I'm having to deal with. And those two things are fear and dread. That's what he's saying. I'm walking through a valley, and, and I'm afraid. I'm walking through a valley and there is dread all around me. Let me tell you what, let me tell you what fear, what fear does. Fear puts you under the threat. Whatever that valley that you're walking through at that point in time carries with it a particular threat. A threat of your security, a threat of your future, a threat of, of, of a relationship, a threat. Whatever valley you're walking through always has a threat attached to it. And what fear does is that fear puts you under the threat. Let me tell you what faith does. Let me tell you what godly righteousness does. Let me tell you what the word of righteousness, the word, the instruction of righteousness. Let me tell you what it does. So fear puts you under the threat, but faith puts the threat into perspective. Are you hearing me? 
The threat causes fear. Faith causes the threat and brings it into perspective. Basically, here's what it says. I, I'm well aware that I'm walking through a valley. I'm well aware that there is both fear and dread that I have to deal with. But I am posturing myself and my response to the threat that is being represented to me is this, is that threat you have to answer to God. I don't have to answer to you, which is what fear wants you to do. Fear wants you to answer to it and to the threat of fear. I don't have to answer to you. You have to answer to God. And so then his response is always the word. Here's, here's, what, here's what David is saying. Number one, jot these things down because I think they're very important especially if you're walking through a situation in your life right now. Number one is this. And here's what David is saying. I will fear no evil. What is he saying? I choose to deal with the emotions that I'm walking through. I'm going to deal with those emotions. There, there are times, for, first of all, I thank God for my wife. She is a woman of God. And I thank God for her. She doesn't carry a lot of baggage. She carries some baggage from time to time, as we all do. We walk through that. But she doesn't carry the kind of baggage that I have a tendency to carry from a, a ridiculous past. She doesn't carry all that. And so, when, and, and so what that means is that, and I tell her all this time, girl, you pray real good. I mean, you just pray good. And, and I can bring an emotional issue that I'm walking through relative to something that I might, you know, something in my body or, you know, something I'm going through. Somebody said something and I got offended or I got hurt and, you know, I'm kind of under it and I'm kind of walking through my own little valley. By, by the way, a lot of the valleys that I walk through personally, I don't know about you, a lot of the valleys that I walk through are valleys that I've built myself. Hello? Is that true with you too? Tell, just tell your friends, he, he is so preaching to you this morning. I, I just feel that. Tell, tell him, I just feel this word is for you specifically today. I can bring that to Michelle and I'll say, baby, let, let, will you pray over this? She said, what you going through? And I'll tell her and, and, and we'll just come into agreement together. And what are we doing? We're dealing with the emotions. And then all of a sudden, how many times have the things that I pretty much have brought to you, and really our prayer really isn't really about that issue, it's more about my response to that issue. Because then a little bit of time will go by, and we'll find out, wait a minute, I blew that up in my mind bigger than it really is. It's not really even an issue. And she's just shaking her head going, this guy right here, man, I don't know what I'm going to do with him. And she just keeps praying, just keeps believing. What do we do? We're dealing with the emotions of the moment without letting them get out of hand. Can I tell you, if you'll learn principle number one, deal, say it with me, deal with the emotions, deal with the emotions. If you'll, if you'll learn that, and at that point, go ahead and just step into that and go, I, I, I'm not going to let these emotions get out of control. Because the, the longer and the more you let the emotions get out of control, the bigger the seemingly situation becomes. And, and I've also discovered this. If I'm not careful, I'm the guy that will let my emotions create a spinoff effect. And now all of a sudden, instead of just dealing with the issue, I've got to deal with all the things that I've created. I'm, I'm going to say something to them. Okay, uh, you know, what I've learned also is to check with her first. Her name is Michelle Holy Spirit Reese. <laughs> but I've learned just to, you know, if, if I don't get a clear sense, I'm gonna, she, she'll be like, don't, don't say anything. Could you just hold off on that? How many of you have been on Facebook and wanted to say something? The Holy Spirit said, just let that go. <laughs> Come on. Sometimes you just got to let it go. Number one, deal with the emotions. Number two is this, is, is, is he's saying, I'm going to close the door to that. I'm putting it, I will, what am I doing? When I make this declaration, I will not be afraid. I'm closing the door to it. I'm closing the door to, to the emotions. And watch this, it's this. I will not make room for the spirit of fear to run loose in my mind, my will, or my emotions. I think it's, 
I don't remember how many years it's been now, but I think most of you have t uh, know that, I mean, I, I went through a time in my life when I really had to reset my brain, and that was a good thing. I reset my brain from the emotional fear and the triggers that were causing. I went through uh, the, the program, what was it called, uh, 30, what was it? Yeah, Dr. Caroline Leaf. And uh, what, what she taught me was that there are, are neurons in your brain which literally become tracks upon which your thoughts run. And you literally can create new neurons and you can recreate your brain. That's an amazing thing to me. Amen. I love that, that Dr. Leaf says that, that uh, your brain and your mind are two different things. You've got to know that. There's a, a literal brain, and it has neurons. And, and what happens is, is that neurons and, and creates tracks or ways of thinking in your mind, and, and you respond to every situation based on the track that you've already. So if your track is one of fear, and every little thing that happens, and your mind says, be afraid of that, you'll be afraid. And you know how, you know how I reset my mind through her program? Through the Word of God. See, the only way you'll do it is through the Word of God. And you have to give, you, you have to give time and, and repetition, getting the Word in you, saying that, you know, when I, and I would write out things like, when I encounter this, here's my response. And now I learn to respond according to the Word and not according to the natural realm of thinking that, that got me in trouble in the, in the first place. I'm removing the tracks that fear and dread run on. Now, are y'all getting that this morning? And you can do that. You can change the way you think. You can change the way you perceive. You can change the way that you respond to particular situations. And at the point in time when that situation occurs to say, no, I'm not going to think like this. I'm going to think like that. I'm not. And David is saying, I, I am refusing right now, even though everything around me is falling apart, I refuse to be afraid. I have a right to be afraid, but I'm not going to be. I have a right to be in dread because I've never been through this before or I've been through it before and I know what happened then and that's probably what's going to happen now. That's what your mind tells you until you become a, a person of the word that says, no, this is what God says about the situation that I'm working through and walking through in my life. Amen. Amen. So the first principle is this, I will fear no evil. Say it with me. I will fear no evil. And I come to that place of conviction. I come to that place of confidence. The second one is this, is that you are with me. I'm walking in not the theology of the presence of the Lord, but the reality of the presence of the Lord. You are an ever-present help in the time of need. What, what, I, what I know is this, is that even though I might be going through a very difficult time in my life, and, and I'm walking through, and I feel alone, I'm never alone. He's always with me. He's an ever-present help in the time of need. The word with, for you are with me, is the, is the Hebrew word emad, I-M-A-W-D, emad. And it means this, where, where God is, is in Matthew 28, 20, says, I am always with you, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Emad is God said this, I have, you have to know, going into a difficult season, in the midst of a difficult season, or coming out of a difficult season, or watching somebody else go at the difficult season, you have to know this that I have already wrapped you in my presence. That's Imad. For, for I, you are with me. You've wrapped me on every side in your presence, and therefore I don't have to fear any evil. The third principle is this, is that your rod and your staff bring comfort to me as I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. The, there, there, there's two, two words here that are a actually happening. Rod is the word Shabet, S-H-E-B-E-T, and it means the scepter of the king. I remember when there was, there was a time in my life when because we all, we all love the, 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 shepherd's, the shepherd's staff, but there is a sense of the Lord saying, I remember a time when he said, I, I, I want you to come under my, my scepter. I want you to come under my authority. You, you want my comfort, but, but and, and oftentimes we want Jesus, can I just say this? Oftentimes we want Jesus to be our Savior, but we're not really interested in him becoming our Lord. 
We want him to comfort us and we want him to, to be our loving, gentle savior leading us into green pastures. But oftentimes we don't want to come under his authority. That, that's what's wrong with a lot of the church now. I'm, I'm not bashing churches, but listen, I got to tell you, at the end of the day, I'm not listening to, <laughs> in fact, can I just say this? I've decided to quit following sheep, and now I'm following the shepherd. Are you hearing me? We've got to be in a place where we have that true north, and, and that we have an understanding coming under, under the Shabbat of God, coming under the scepter, the authority of the king, and the word staff is the word Mishanah, the root of Sha'an, and it means, to, it means to comfort you. The staff of God is his comfort extended to you, especially during times of pain, suffering, and tribulation. How many of you have ever gone through a great loss in your life? And what you have to know is this, is that there is a, there is a presence, an anointing, there, there is a, a mantle and a mandate that is placed upon you unlike any other time in your life. And you have to know that. When my first wife went to be with the Lord, a, a, a pastor friend of mine who had gone through the exact same situation, he took me aside and he said, I want to I tell you something that you need to hear me say. He said, there is a, a mantle. You've never known this mantle before because you've never had to have it before. But there is a mantle that the very moment that that happened, the shepherd stepped in and he, he covered you with a mantle. And he said, it is a mantle of his grace. It is a mantle that specifically belongs to people that are walking through what you are walking through right now. And nobody else, no one else that has, that's not walked through this, no one else understands it. I want to tell you this morning, if you've lost a loved one, if you've lost a husband or you've lost a wife, there is a mantle of grace that is upon you now that was never there before. Are you hearing me? There is a mantle of authority that is upon you that you've never known before. There is a mantle of provision that is upon you. There is a mantle that surrounds you. When God says, I have wrapped you in my presence. You can know that I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth, and nothing shall by any means harm you. He's saying, I've wrapped you in my presence. What is he saying? I have put upon you the mantle of my authority and my grace. I put upon you the mantle and the covering of who I am over you. I'm a husband to the husbandless. Come on. And that's what... That's what David is saying is that in these times, your, your staff comforts me. It's God saying literally with, with this word, with this word, Mishian or Sha'an, he's saying, I'm extending to you my grace. I talked about that of the loss of a spouse, but let me just say to you, the loss of any arena of your life. The Lord is saying to you that when you walk through those valleys and you walk through those difficult times in your life when things just in the natural just aren't making sense. He's saying, I'm extending to you my grace, I'm extending to you my mercy, and I'm extending to you my forgiveness. Can I say to you this morning something that might shock you? Your setback in life, and I heard the Lord clearly say this to me this morning, your setback in life does not make you a fraud. And that's the lie of the enemy. He's causing people of God, men of God, women of God to see themselves as, well, you're a fraud. I'll go one more time, but I'm a fraud. You've actually said that to yourself. I'm a fraud. Your setback, your failure does not make you a fraud. Let me say one more thing with that, with him extending over you the staff of, the, the staff of his grace, which isn't a license to sin. You, you don't understand that by now. I'm extending over you. I'm going to say this to you. Your setback does not make you a fraud. And your sin does not make you a sinner. You're not a fraud. And you're not a sinner. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. You've been saved. You've been redeemed. You've been made whole. And you belong to him. Amen. Amen. Have my kids ever done anything that would embarrass me as a father? Absolutely. Just like I did things that embarrassed my father. 
things that were outside of, 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 of the rules and the regulations of our home or, or the standard of how we lived. And I stepped outside of the bounds. I didn't go home that night and my dad said, hey, by, by, by the way, you're no longer a Reese. You, you, you stepped out of what you know is right. You're no longer a Reese. What did he do? He pulled me into correction. Come on. I, I was corrected. I was disciplined. I, was, I, I, I had to carry the weight and the consequences of my decision, but I wasn't thrown out of the family. Your sin does not make you a sinner. To say that I'm a sinner speaks to not, not your actions. A sinner doesn't speak to your actions. A sinner speaks to the fact that you, you had a, a, an unredeemed nature. And the unredeemed nature belongs to a sinner. I don't know if it's quiet because you're like soaking this up and getting that. Or, or you're like, wow, where's this guy come up with this stuff? Or if you've ever been there. But your sin does not make you a sinner. Now, does that give you a license? Oh, well, you know, hey, he said Sunday, I'm not a sinner. Hey, let's go have a party. It's not that at all. I don't, I'm not giving you a license to sin. I'm telling you that when you do fall before God, God's heart is to pick you up and to restore you and to redeem you. His heart is to cleanse you, to renew you. To, to, to put you in a place of, and does it mean that the Lord will correct you? Absolutely. Why, what's the Bible say? He, he disciplines those that he what? That he loves. Are y'all getting this? Yes. So then, this is David saying that whenever, so now there, there's the staff, and then all of a sudden we've got this issue of the scepter. And David is saying this, at the point in time that I find myself surrounded by death, decay, and despair, I choose at that moment to come under, it's on the screen, the authority of the king. I come under the authority of the king. So what do I do? When, when I'm in those moments, what do I do? I have to make a decision that, Lord, I'm, I'm walking through this, so I got to know I come under your authority. I come under the covering of, of your word. And I use your word to deflect and to shield the lies and the strategies of the enemy and things that other people might say to me. Even well-intentioned people might say things to me that find a place in my heart and put a seed down in my soul that is not of God. And so I have to know as I'm coming under the, the righteous integrity of the authority of the word of God that I know what God says about this situation and what I'm walking through in my life. So his scepter is the ultimate source of protection, guidance, and comfort. And it's the invitation of the Lord to come under his loving authority. In fact, it's what the Ten Commandments are all about. Ten Commandments are not a list of do's and don'ts. The Ten Commandments are not this, this fact of, well, if, if you're going to walk before me, you will do this and you won't do that. No, it's the Lord inviting you to say, come under my loving authority. I, want, my, I protect you by virtue of you understanding and, and coming into covenant relationship with me. So let me finish this up this morning. Then all of a sudden he gets to this change of focus. And hear me say, if you're walking through a valley this morning, if you're walking through a difficult season of your life, if you're walking through a time of loss in your life, if you're walking through a, a season of despair and decay and disappointment, what you need this morning is a, you ready? You need a change of focus. Because here's what the enemy does. He specializes in turning molehills into mountains. He specializes in making this thing so big that you get a, a, an image in your mind, I'll never get over this. And I'm destined to live my life going around this same old mountain over and over again all the time. And that's not the reality of who you are, and that's not the reality of your faith. And so David comes to this point in, 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 in verse 5, and he says, I need a change of focus. And here's the change of focus. There is a table before me in the very presence of my enemies. Let me just give you a word study real quick on this. He said, you, you prepare. It's the word arak, A-R-A-K, and, and it means that, that things have been arranged and things have been set in order. What is he saying? Even in the midst of the valley, I've already set in order who I want you to become. 
I've already established an order for you to come out of the valley. I've already established a specific order of the anointing that is going to bring you from the place of brokenness to the place of wholeness, if you'll follow me. I've already established, I've set in order, watch this, I've arranged, I've set in order, and it literally means this, that it is a legal entity. A rock means that I have legally set up and arranged for you to come out of this mess. In other words, the enemy has no hold over you. And what he wants you to think is that you, he has a right to push you and to shove you in the ground because of decisions that you've made. And God is saying, come before me, come under my scepter, come under my staff, and come into a place of covenant relationship with me, and I'll set an order, and I'll set a presence of my spirit before you, and I'll get you out of this mess. I love that about the Lord. What he would just say to us, I'll get you out of this mess and I'll set you forth. And the word table, I'll prepare a table. It's the shulchan and it means the table of the king. I love that. It's a, it's a sense of God saying, I'm bringing in the midst of your despair the, the very presence of, of who I am royally before you. And the table that I set is the presence of, is the, presence of the king. And he says this, and let me focus on this. He says, I'm, I'm setting a table before you, even in the presence of your enemies. The word tasar is, is that word enemy. And it doesn't actually mean, watch now, because this is very, very important. It doesn't actually mean the entity of an enemy. In other words, the personage of an enemy. When he says in the presence of, I'm, I'm, I'm changing focus for you, it, tasar means this. It means that it is the tactics of the enemy or the results of the enemy's tactics. The results of his tactics. Not, not the enemy himself. And quite often what we do is that we take that word enemy and we relate it to somebody that we know. We relate it to flesh and blood. And he says, actually, what's happening here is that when you're walking through the results and you're living under the results of the enemy's tactics... I'm going to change your focus, and I'm going to help you realize you're actually sitting at the table of the king. And here's what the enemy's tactics are that, that Tassar refers to. You ready? Write these down. Distress. That when you're walking through distress, I want to remind you of who you are. Distress. Despair. When you're walking through a season of despair in your life, I don't know how we're going to do this. I don't know how we're going to get through this. I don't know how I'm going to get over this mountain that's before me. I don't know if I go over it. I don't know if I go around it. And he says in your, in your distress, your despair, number three, your disappointments, and then number four, even your distractions. So when he talks about enemies and reminding you who you are, He's talking about the season that you walk through of distress, despair, disappointment, and, and distractions. And he says, and here, here's, there's two things that I'm doing. I'm bringing you to the table of my father. I'm bringing you into the presence of royalty. I'm setting before you a, a banquet feast of who I am. I'm changing your focus because you are so caught up in what's before you that you have forgotten who you are. You are so caught up in, in what this thing has done to you and what it could possibly mean for you in your future that you've lost sight of what it is that I've, I have done in you. And what I've done in you is I have royally redeemed you. I, I believe that there was, and I believe the scripture bears this out, there was a literal change, an alteration of DNA when you became born again. In fact, some of you may have read the post that I woke up at 3 in the morning the other night and the Lord said just this stuff that he just downloads just blows my mind. And I get like, I can hardly wait to get this. To, I want them to see this. He says, when you were born, you were born into my image. But when you were born again, you were born into my nature. He said, you can't live out your life just in image alone. That's how we get deceived, by false images. But when you were born again, there was something of my nature. And he's saying here, I, I want to release the redemptive nature of who I am when you're walking through distress and despair and disappointment and, and distraction. I want to remind you of who you are. You are royally redeemed. And the mess that you're in right now is no place for the child of the king. 
and I have put in place your release. I have put in place the, 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 the ability for you to get out of this mess. Come on, say amen to that. And then so, I'm about to close, by, by the way. Whoever needs to hear that, I'm closing. He says, so you're walking through this season, and I want to change your focus. I'm going to remind you who you are. I'm going to bring you to my table. And he goes, and while you're at the table, I'm going to anoint you. Why am I anointing you? I'm not just anointing you. Look at me, everybody. I'm not, the Lord would say that I'm not just anointing you because of the valley that you're in right now. I'm anointing you because you're about to come out of the valley. The anointing is that the glory of God is not just for your time in the valley. The glory of God, the anointing of God is for when you come out of the valley. Because God has something brand new for you. And so I love this word. He says, and you, you anoint my head with oil so that my cup is, is running over. That's, that's a great word. Revaya. Say it with me. Revaya. Well, that'll preach right there. Revaya. And it means this. Not to, not to anoint you. I love when we anoint people up here and I, we do the little thumb thing and we just kind of, you know, a little dab a do ya. That, that's not Revaya. Revaya is the cup of the Lord. So here we are at this table. I'm going through the worst time in my life. And the Lord says, yeah, cook, let, let's have lunch. Come and sit down with me. And I, I, wanna, I want you to feast on my goodness. I want you to feast on my presence. I want you to feast on the redemptive nature and the grace of who I am. And so we get done. And so I, the Lord, that, that changed my focus, man. I'm feeling good now. Come on, amen. That was a thank you for that. He goes, it's, it's not over. How many of you ever get to the end of the meal and you're like looking around going, where's dessert? He says, it's not over. I've not just royally redeemed you, but now I, I, want to, I want to overflow you with the presence and the glory of who I am. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to rave by y'all. Say it with me. Revaya. Say it again. Revaya. And he says, I'm poor now. Not a little dab. I'm in, it literally, Revaya means to saturate you. To saturate you. My wife keeps these little sponges at our sink in the kitchen. It's got a little scrub thing on one side and a regular sponge on the other. And when I open up the drawer where, where they're stored, every single time I open it up and I grab one, and it's like a, it's like a brick. But I get that thing in Revaya. I get it and, and, and I can do nothing with it. It's just, it's just nothing, just ridiculous. I can't clean anything with it. But when I take it and I hold it under that hot water just for a second, and that sponge says, oh, yeah, baby. I've been, I've been in the dark. I've been inside this cabinet. I've been waiting for you, man of God, to find me. Come on, get me, hold me. Put me under. Revaya! And that sponge just says, oh, God, oh, I needed this. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> and then you know what I can do to that sponge? Now all of a sudden it's flexible. Now all of a sudden it's for good use. Do y'all get that illustration? Now all of a sudden I can take that because it's been through the Revaya moment. I can take it and just squeeze it. Before I couldn't even squeeze it. It was it wouldn't even bend. It was on, it was and I can squeeze it. And 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 that water just comes pouring out. And now I can use it to do whatever I want to do with it. Lord, may I just experience the Revaya of God in my life. I've been in the dark. I've been through the valley. I'm in a moment. I mean, man, I've been beat up on every side. I go and I step into something and I get shipwrecked and snakes are jumping out and biting me in junk, Paul said. I, I just need that. I, I come to the table of the Lord. And now here we come to the end of it. And he says, now I want to just pour out on you. And many times we're like, oh, you know what? Okay. Uh, I, it's, that's why we're going to have three teams down here and like we do every Sunday now. Our yes team, our ministry team, and our prophetic team. 
Some of you need to forego or at least be willing to go to lunch late. Some of you just need to say, you know what? I need to raise Vaya in my life. I need, I need to get down there where somebody can get their hands on me. I need to get down there and get some things broken off of me. I need to get down there and get somebody to come into agreement with me. Especially if, if, if you live by yourself and these are the moments where this is us Sabbathing together. Can I just give you a, a, just a pastoral prophetic moment and say to you lovingly and tenderly and kindly, stop coming to church. Well, don't take that wrong. <laughs> stop coming to church. Come and Sabbath with the people of God. Come and, and this, is my, this is my Sabbath. My rhythm isn't just to get up on Sunday and come and, and worship and word and then bam, I'm out of here. No, 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 no. I need someone to lay hands on me. I need somebody to prophesy over me. I need somebody to come into agreement with me, to come into agreement with God's plans and his purposes for my life. I need a revaya moment in my life because I'm dry. I need, I need the, the outpouring in my life because I'm in a time and season of of, of despondency and, and despair and distress and distraction. And so I'm going to come. And it may just be as simple as you turn into some of your sinners and say, hey, before, before we leave today, could you, could you Sabbath with me for a few moments? Could you Sabbath with me and, 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 and just come into agreement with me? And let's put some Revaya in place. And so then finally, bam. He says this. Feel that Revaya? He says this. When he gets to verse 6, he makes a declaration. So he's going through these prophetic principles that God wants to do when you're walking through that valley. He gets to verse 6 and shifts again. And now all of a sudden, he future focuses. He says, I've been in this valley. I've walk, I'm walking through these things. And now I come to the table of the king. And I come to the outpouring of God in my life. And now I'm coming to the end of the valley. And I'm about to come out. And so then what the king does is that he issues what I call a call up. I believe that these times together when we Sabbath are always a call up. When I, when I sit before the Lord, even something in the mornings and I'm by myself at different times or even on my porch and, 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 I'm, and I'm just saturating and there's just, an, there's just a, an, an impartation, it's always a call up. It's always the Lord saying to me, son, I, I, I want to take you to a new place. I want to take you to a new level of understanding. I want to take you to a new level of the anointing. I want to introduce you to a new level of my favor. I want to show you how to step into a new level of my provision for your life. I'm calling you up to a new place. Remember the, the ascension of the mountain? Instead of just going in one circle, it's always moving upward, giving you a new ability to see at new heights. And so verse 6, when he says, Now i got to tell you, surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Look at me, everybody. I'm closing. You will not be in the valley. I know it feels like it now. If you're in a valley right now of any size, I want to say to you this morning, you will not be in the valley all your life. In fact, your valley has a beginning and it also has an end. It's what happens in the middle of it that's important. That in the middle of that valley, instead of you freaking out and losing it and just fighting your way to the end, that you just come to the place of, of, just, uh, of just surrender. Lord, bring me, bring me, Lord, to your table. Bring me to that moment of revaya. And you come out and, da and, D and David says, I'm not in this valley 
all my life. What he does say is that goodness and mercy are going to follow me all the days of my life. And where I'm headed, what, what's on the other end of the valley? The house of the Lord. Where I'm stepping into the goodness of God. It's the word tobe, and it means the welfare of God, the prosperity of God, the benefit of God, the fullness of God. I got to tell you, and you've heard this, God's delays are not never his denials. And you got to know this, that in those moments when you're taken into a valley season of your life, if you, if you mishandle that season, it could extend the valley. But if you'll handle it properly, it'll take you to a place of promotion. It'll take you to a place of, of, of coming into the goodness of the Lord. And it take you to a place of coming into the welfare and the benefit of God. And he says this, that's the goodness of God and the mercy of, of God is the word you probably know. It's the word chased, C-H-A-C-E-D, chased. And it means that in the midst of, I love this, even when the valley was created by your own doing, the Lord says that in that moment, as I'm bringing you out of it, you're going to know my goodness, and you're going to know my mercy. You're going to know my chassad. And the chassad simply means this, is that he has removed all shame and all reproach. That you come out of that time where you come out of it actually stronger than when you went into it. The enemy specializes in, in reminding you of, of who you were. The enemy specializes in, in causing you to carry the guilt of your past. The enemy specializes in, and uh, I put a, a t-shirt on this morning just when I get out of bed just to kind of tool around the house and go sit out on the porch. In fact, it was my ragbri shirt that my friends bought me for serving them so above and beyond the, the call. And I didn't even know it. I mean, last night I had it and I got home from the night of worship and Michelle had a meal and, and I, man, I come home and I'm hungry. I'm tearing it up. And this morning I thought, man, I must have been a sight. I had blotches all over that shirt. I don't know what it was, but it was, I don't know, look at that shirt. Like, That's a mess. I wouldn't wear, I wouldn't wear that stained t-shirt to church this morning because I have a sense of decorum and who I am and but listen, the enemy specializes in causing us to walk around and seeing ourselves as, as stained. We look in the mirror and we go, yeah, no, that, that, that's who I am, really. I'm a fraud. Yeah, that, that, that's who I am. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a sinner. That's why I hate that phrase, sinner. Well, I'm a sinner saved by grace. That sounds so spiritual and it is so ungodly. You're not a sinner that's saved by grace. The blood is stronger than that. You are the redeemed of God, forgiven, cleansed, made whole. Does that mean that you're perfect? No. But it means that you're perfectible. It means that when you do fall, that the conviction of Holy Spirit is there to redeem you. And he says, surely, goodness and mercy, all my shame and all my reproach has been removed from my life. And, and, and they will follow me, radically pursue me all the way, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let me tell you about the house of the Lord. And you see that I've closed my notes in my Bible. The house of the Lord is that, let me just, a lot of times we just want to go, yeah, everybody. No, no, the house of the Lord is only open to family. Can I say that to you? That's, that, that's, that's a big, big statement. God doesn't say, well, I'm going to open my house and everybody can just come on in. No, what he says is this. Everybody is welcome, but only family can come in. Everybody's welcome into the house of the Lord. I want to do what I do for my family. I want, in fact, I want you to be my family. But until you become my family, the house is off limits to you. Church, I got to tell you, we are, the Bible says, we are a peculiar people. We're a royal nation. We're a holy priesthood. Called by his name and called out of darkness. Come on, amen. 
And there's something of that that God wants to anchor to the depths of your soul and to your identity. You're walking through the valley. I call you out. In Jesus' name. I call you out in his timing, not mine. But I can assure you this, that as long as you're walking through it, if you'll come under the scepter, if you'll come under the staff, he'll bring you to his table, he'll give you the revaya of God, and you'll come out of full and overflowing with his goodness and his mercy. And that, my friends, is the prophetic Psalms 23. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. How'd I do? Not bad, huh? Best, best sermon series I think I've ever heard. So, I mean, you know, ah, I'm kidding. Let's pray together. Could, could we just take a moment? Could we just kind of ourselves anchor? We've already stepped into a lot this morning, the day of decision. Some of you have made some incredible steps forward this morning in our time together. As we just allow the, the word and the and Holy Spirit to shepherd us through this prophetic psalm. But this morning, I want to specifically pray for those that are walking through a, a dark period. And I want to tell you that if that's you, and you know it is, please don't just get up and leave out of here in a hurry. I'm gonna, I don't know how it's happened, but we're dismissing church earlier than ever. So I want you just to take a few moments and hang around. Get into the presence. It says of Joshua that even after Moses left the tent of meeting, Joshua stayed. And he just lingered in the presence of God. God has a word for you this morning. God wants to have, have, have our team lay hands upon you and get you free. So, uh, Father, I pray today for anybody that's walking this morning in, in that valley. And I thank you, Lord, today that you have a plan and a purpose. And your plans and your purposes are always according to your word. Yes and amen. And that, God, your purposes to, to us are always redemptive. Lord, thank you that you're not mad at me. But thank you that you, you long to correct me. You long to discipline me. You long to bring me to a place, Lord, where, where I'm brought into check. I want to be brought into check, Lord. Because I want to be a useful servant. But I thank you, Lord, this morning that for those that are in the valley right now, I want to introduce you to the table of the king. I want to introduce you to the feast of the spirit. I want to introduce you. In fact, we're, we're in the feast of tabernacles right now. I want to introduce you to the feast of the Lord where you can come and taste of his goodness, taste of his forgiveness, taste of his mercy, and that you'll be able to say, taste and see the Lord. He really is good. And he really does love me. and He really does forgive me. I pray, Lord, that the heaviness and the weight of the valley I can pray this off, it would be lifted off of you now in Jesus' name. And the chaos and the confusion that has resulted as a, a fact of you being in the valley will be lifted off of you in Jesus' name. And I pray that this morning that your eyes would be open, your spiritual understanding would be enlightened. I pray that the, the heaviness, the burden of what you're carrying today would be lifted off of you supernaturally in Jesus' name right now. Would you just receive that? Just tell the Lord, Lord, I receive that in Jesus' name. I want to pray and lead in prayer this morning those that are at a place in your life where you need to say yes to the Lord. You need, you need, and whatever it means that you've never asked, you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, or you're walking in a way that you know is disheartening and displeasing to him, and you need to say yes to him this morning. Yes, Lord. I receive the fullness of who you are in my life. And I, yes, I want to make you the Lord of my life. This morning, if you've never prayed that prayer or if you need to pray a prayer of dedication, I want to lead you in that prayer. And then we'll close with a, a prayer of dismissal this morning. Would you pray this with me? Father God, as I come to you today, I know that I am a sinner. I know that I have walked away from you as my Lord. And today, I don't, I don't want to keep living in this place. Today, I don't, I don't want to keep being in a place, Father, where who I am is compromised. I'm tired of giving away my purpose. I'm tired of, of stepping and living in the shadows. And today, I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to cleanse me. I confess my faults. 
and I ask you to become the Lord of my life. I choose today to make you the Lord of my life. In this moment, at this time, in Jesus' name, everyone said amen. Amen. Praise God. Listen, if you prayed that particular prayer, we have three teams that are about to come up here, and we're continuing to Sabbath together. We're going to have the yes team that will be over here. If you prayed that prayer with me, we have some, a, a Bible that we'd like to give to you. They want to pray with you. We want to get information that we can help you in the decision that you've made. So come up here. Let our yes team pray with you. We have a ministry team that's going to be here in the middle. And if you, have, if you need physical healing on, on corporate sun, communion Sunday, we don't open up the, 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 the prayer room. We do it entirely after the service. But if you have need healing in your body, if, you, if you're walking through a difficult time, let our ministry team come into agreement with you. Get on that revaya of God this morning. Don't just run out. Come up here. Linger before the Lord a little bit. Or if you need a word from God, maybe we have a prophetic team that's been praying for you. And in fact, some of you that come up to the prophetic team, they're not going to be surprised to see you because they've been praying for you specifically. If you need a, a prophetic direction or word from the Lord, our prophetic team is going to be over here to, to my left, to, to your right. And so either three of those teams, I'd like to invite you to come and participate and taste and see that God really is good. Amen? Had it been good to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Could we stand together? And as we do, could we just applaud his presence in this house today? God, you're a good God. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise. You're so worthy, Lord. We magnify you. Would you hold your hands before the Lord and then Pastor Kenny's going to come. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you, to be gracious unto you. May the Lord God lift his countenance upon you. And may he give you his peace. And may you live all the days of your life walking in the revaya moments of God where he is just saturating you with his presence, his glory, his favor. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. 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 Pastor Kenny.